Welcome to Prophetic Insights. I'm Hilary Henriquez. I'm Pastor Andrew Henriquez. Our purpose here is to give you an in-depth biblical analysis of the current events that are taking place both in the world and also in the church, indicating that the coming of the Lord is nigh. Now, recently we've been hearing a lot of talk about what Pope Francis is doing openly and how he is really aggressive and moving rapidly to establish Sunday sacredness and how the world at large are ready to accept his agenda. And we can see clearly based on that, that the mark of the beast is only moments away. Well, as we look in the church, the Seventh Day Adventist Church and some of the issues that have been going on, we should be able to just as clearly see that the coming of the Lord is at hand and it is time to be about our Lord's business. Well, one such event that we're going to discuss today is something that has been taking place in secrecy. But I believe that the Lord has allowed this information to be brought to the forefront, made public so that his people can see what's been happening behind the scenes for quite some time. Well, Florida Conference President Mike Cauley recently wrote an email, and I would like to share a little bit of that email that was supposed to be private but was made public regarding Doug Batchelor. It says, recently Florida Conference of Seventh-day Adventists recommended a change in programming to one of our local churches. Doug Batchelor, speaker for Amazing Facts, had been scheduled for a one-week meeting this fall at Spring Meadows Church. However, the Florida Conference administration views Pastor Batchelor as a polarizing influence in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This concern revolves around the subject of women's involvement in ministry, both as local elders and pastors, and that the position that he has taught openly for several years is not in harmony with the position and policy of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. This is how he closes the communication. Therefore, we discouraged Spring Meadows Church from following through with the invitation to Pastor Bachelor. And this isn't just for Spring Meadows Church. This is just the church he was invited to speak at. So as the president of the Florida Conference, this would be throughout the entire conference that he is unwelcome. And this is the same Mike Cauley, president of Florida Conference, who on July 17, 2015, posted this statement on his Facebook page, just as the one you read on his Facebook page. He says, a close look today at the Adventist Church in North America reveals that the church is in need of a deep change. If it is going to remain viable in accomplishing its mission, especially in reaching people under age 40, now and as they grow older. And then the president goes on to quote from a secular author, Robert Quinn. Then the president, Mike Hawley, stated the following. Here are some of the reasons that I feel this way. One, studies indicate that we, we are losing 40 to 45% of those we baptize. Two, research in South Florida shows that we are losing 60 to 70% of our young people in immigrant churches, Latin and Caribbean, after high school, and we are not retaining our youth in those congregations. Three, there are very few African American churches in some regional conferences. The work is being sustained only by the influx of our Caribbean members and converts, but we are not reaching indigenous black Americans. Four, many of the Caucasian members in NAD, North American Division, are older. Younger white families are conspicuously 
absent. And then my colleague ended this Facebook post by saying, I believe God is calling us to face the challenge and talk about it, and then to lay aggressive strategies. Here is a link to a symposium or conference where we will begin to address these issues in 2016. Now the question must be asked, who will my colleague, the president, allow to enter the churches in the Florida conference to bring about revival and reformation to what he calls dying churches? If presently he is uh, marginalizing and barring a speaker such as Doug Batchelor from Amazing Facts. Doug Batchelor, who has done a lot for Seventh-day Adventism. Through his ministry, many souls have been won to the truth of Seventh-day Adventism. I wonder what is my colleague about going to do very, very shortly to revive what he calls dying churches in the Florida Conference. I believe he's alluding to the new organization that Sister White has spoken about in first selected messages. But as we were speaking earlier, you had mentioned the timing that this um, email yes. became public and yes. you were explaining the irony of, of that. This incident, my colleague, barring Doug Batchelor and his ministry from ministering in a church or in the churches, on the Florida Conference. It is on the heels of a article written by Bill Knott, editor of Adventist Review Online. And the title is striking. It says, A Time to Marginalize. I'm gonna read a few statements from this article from Bill Knott. It says, but there is a kind of marginalization that is both healthy and necessary for the church to practice. Recent events have underscored why now may be the moment for God's people to thoughtfully and systematically exclude those elements that have proved themselves hostile to our life together. If you were to read some of these comments, one specifically asks the question, uh, Mr. Not, Bill Knott, who are some of these individuals and ministries that we need to bar from the churches? Who are some of these ministers that we must marginalize? People want to know. He goes on to say in this article, and this is in the context of the 2015 General Conference session in San Antonio. It says, so here, Bill Knott speaking, so here is a call to shut our ears, protect our pulpits, change the channel, and withhold our dollars from those of whatever ideological camp who practice the uncivil and unrighteous behaviors we witnessed before San Antonio. Yes, he said, move them to the margins, draw the boundaries of our community in such a way that only repentance and changed behavior will again allow them full inclusion. Bill not a time to marginalize. Look at what the church has come to. It's obvious that this is an issue of control. And you know, you had mentioned, you had mentioned Mike Colley making a Facebook post, and this is how he responded after he realized that uh, his communication, his private email communication went viral. And he said, the power of social media is arresting. On Friday, we responded to four emails about our concern with the speaker, director of Amazing Facts coming to speak. Today, that reply is everywhere. Disappointing. It was not our intent to make a public thing of this. So as long as it's done in secrecy and in private, it's okay. But when it becomes public and people begin to talk and people begin to question and they begin to show uh, disgust for this kind of behavior, then, you I know. Heard, I heard, I read one statement 
wherein someone called for his resignation. But the point we want to make here is that this incident, my colleague, uh, barring uh, amazing facts, Doug Batchelor, from ministering to a church or churches in the Florida Conference, it is not a singular or isolated event. We need to recall that the General Conference President, Elder Ted Wilson, and his associates, they also had a similar confrontation with David Gates. And I termed it a few months back, bullying. How the General Conference leaders were bullying Elder David Gates of Gospel Ministries International. And what happened was, once Elder Ted Wilson was brought in as the General Conference President, he held a meeting with David Gates. And he stated that there were some issues with David Gates and his ministry. And the, conver the, the communication went on. And the leaders of the General Conference gave to David Gates a list of stipulations he had to follow in order to continue to do ministry within the Seventh-day Adventist world field. David Gates in a video responding and giving this testimony, not my words, David Gates' words, he said when his board met, they were willing to agree with all of the stipulations except for one. I want to read that one stipulation. Number six, it says, supporting ministries, providing services outside their own division territory shall consult with and seek approval via the union from the division administration concerned regarding the nature, extent, and duration of service rendered within that division. This is the general conference working policy, one of them, and also the, the Adventist layman services and industries also uh, have this working policy. And David Gates said that the General Conference leaders, Elder Ted Wilson and his assistants, literally compelled him to sign this document with these stipulations. And he said on the video that he did not sign it. For to sign it would mean to sign away his liberty of conscience in Christ. And the response from the General Conference leaders was simply this, either you sign it or we are going to bar you from doing ministry within the world church. Well, Elder Wilson said that he did not sign it. Elder David Gates said he did not sign the document, only to find out that the General Conference leaders sent a letter to all the unions around the world church stating that they were not to allow David Gates and his ministry to do ministry in their field. Now, I thought about this. If, if, if the church administrators, leaders, are doing this, barring and marginalizing influential men in the church, speakers such as Doug Batchelor and David Gates, who have done so much for Seventh-day Adventism in modern times, what will they do to the other so-called self-supporting ministers or even present truth ministers? What would they do with them? Even now, what are they doing behind closed doors? As I said before, they, I know of churches and conferences who have their own list, blacklist. And on those lists, there are ministers' names that they will not allow to enter their churches and do any form of presentations. I wonder, what are these so-called uh, present truth speakers are going to do when these doors are shut and they can no longer enter into these churches? What are they going to do? My question is, are they going to now see light in those statements regarding true self-supporting ministry? Are they going to see light in those statements? And what we're now seeing 
is that these administrators, they are now the gatekeepers that Christ spoke about in Matthew 23. I want to read that. Matthew 23, Matthew chapter 23. These are the gatekeepers and not the spiritual gatekeepers. These are the apostate gatekeepers. In Matthew 23, Christ made this statement at the closing scenes of his earthly ministry. And where are we now? At the closing scene of this earth's history. Yes. In Matthew 23 and verse number 13, Christ said these words, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men for you neither go in yourselves neither suffer you them that are entering to go in well you know what's truly sad is the fact that this church this denomination with such a rich history as it has champions for religious freedom and religious liberty coming out of the Reformation all the way to 1844. Yes. Now, we denominational leaders are preventing their own members and pastors, you know, from exercising religious liberty because they differ with them as it relates to the word of God. And the truly sad thing is that those that are withholding uh, the opportunity for these ministers to be able to minister in churches, they're not holding on to the word of God. So as you rightly said, they're not true gatekeepers. And so how can we now stand for religious liberty and point the finger at the papacy and how it in yes. times past, you know, persecuted and killed and how it will again, you know, when the Sunday law is passed, uh, withhold liberty of conscience from people when the very same thing is taking place in this denomination. So Hillary, could this be a step showing us that persecution upon God's commandment keeping people will inevitably come from within, oh, within absolutely. the church? Absolutely, we have far more to fear from within than from without. And this incident, and now we can say incidents mm -hmm, of sure. church leaders barring, marginalizing those who are standing for truth. It's a sign of the last days. Look with me at Amos, Amos the seventh chapter. In the book of Amos, Amos chapter seven, we see a typical account with Amos who was preaching the present truth of that day. And listen what this says, because as Amos presented this message and these messages of present truth in his day, the administrators of Israel, the leaders of the church, the majority of them, they told Amos that he could no longer present his messages at Bethel in the churches. He, were, he was to go somewhere else and present what he thought God gave to him. In other words, Amos was marginalized. In other words, Amos was now barred from the churches. Why? He was standing for truth. And the truth God gave to him ran contrary to the policies of those churchmen who were down there in Israel. As it was then, so it is now. Amos chapter 7 and verse number, let's begin with verse number Verse number 11. Let's we'll keep on down to verse number 12. It says, Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go flee thy way into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, Israel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. Then Amos Amos went ahead and responded to Amaziah. And this was the final step when Amaziah, a church administrator, told Amos he could no longer preach. He was barred. He was marginalized from mm -hmm. preaching his God-given message at Bethel. At that point, Amos said, God gave me a vision. And what did God show to Amos in vision? God showed him a basket of Summer fruit. Summer fruit. Mm. And this, this basket of summer fruit was a parable showing the end 
had come for Israel. Probation was about to close. Amos chapter 8, verse 1. This is the continuation of that conversation between Amos and Amaziah. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come upon my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. Hmm. And today, Bill not. Let us marginalize these individuals who are standing for truth on some of these issues, specifically women's ordination. Let's marginalize them. Do you see what's going on? Absolutely. And you know what I found very interesting as you were reading Amos 7 and verse 13, that it was Bethel that had uh, barred, hmm. barred um, the prophet from preaching. And if you look back into the account of Jeroboam, we know that Bethel was one of the very first places that established calf worship, false worship. And there you have it. The churches that want to carry on a false carnival like Mount Sinai type worship, calf worship, modern day calf worship. These are the churches that are closing the doors to the prophet, you know, the spirit of prophecy, closing the door to ministers that will live by the Bible and the spirit yes. of prophecy. Yes. And not only the carnival-like surfaces, but also the theories of the emerging church movement, which is spiritualism. Yes. In 1 Kings chapter 12, it's interesting, Hillary, that you'd bring out that point showing Bethel in Amos and Bethel in 1 Kings in the time of Jeroboam and Rehoboam. What happened there? We had a... A split in the kingdom. We had a division mm -hmm. in the kingdom. And friends, what we need to understand is that since General Conference 2015, there has begun to be a, a division in the world church. On one side of the aisle, we have uh, Dan Jackson, president of the North American division, on one side with those who support him other unions and divisions who support him. On the other side, we have Elder Ted Wilson and those who support him. A division has now come to the Seventh-day Adventist church and that division is only going to get wider. Look at this. And in 1 Kings chapter 12, when Jeroboam in Bethel and Israel and Dan brought in the false system of worship, in verse number 31, it says that, that Jeroboam allowed only men, only men who would support the false system of worship to be able to minister in the churches. And those who would stand for God's truth, they were the ones who were marginalized. They were the ones who were barred. And notice these cutting words in 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 11. The same account, 2 Chronicles chapter 11, it says, in verse 14, it says, For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. Let's pause right there. That's the same place that Amaziah told Amos to go and prophesy. Don't prophesy in Bethel. Go to Judah and prophesy. And here we have it now in 2 Chronicles 11. The faithful ministers could no longer stand for God and present truth in Bethel, in Israel. They had to go to Judah. It says, For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. And Jeroboam ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. So all these faithful ministers were barred from Israel. They had to go somewhere else to be yes. able to minister. I wonder, hmm. I wonder if now God has to now raise up true self-supporting ministers and ministries. As the Lord's messenger, Sister White said, it's the irregular lines. 
through that, God is going to finish his work. Amen. And there's two things happening here because while he's proscribing and barring the true and faithful ministers, he's ordaining, ordaining priests for the high places. So ordination has something to do mm. with this. So they're ordaining profane person, persons, ordaining people that have no biblical authority to be ordained. And we see a similar incident, another account in the days of Christ and John the Baptist. If you look at it, when Christ was baptized and he went into the synagogue in Luke chapter 4, he came to present revival and reformation. But what did the priest and the leaders, the elders and the people do? They wanted to kill him. They took him to the cliff of a hill and were ready to cast him down. Did the churches, the synagogues in Christ's day, did they begin to marginalize Christ? Absolutely. And those who accepted Christ, were they also barred from the churches? Oh, yes. In John chapter 9, the blind son who came seeing, the leaders kicked him out, but Christ received his worship. Amen. In John chapter 12, many refused to acknowledge Christ and his truth. Why? They were afraid to be cast out of the synagogues. And the Bible says in John 12, verse 45 through verse 49, that they loved the praises okay. of men more than the praises of God. Look at John the Baptist. One more example. Even though the Bible does not say John preached in the synagogues of that day, but there was an issue over authority. Yes. Who gave you this authority? They asked Christ. Who gave you this authority? John the Baptist, who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you John the, are you, are you prophet. one of the prophets? Who are you? Why are you baptizing then? So the issue was authority. Right. And Christ made it clear that the same, the same person who gave John the Baptist his authority to do ministry was the same person who gave Christ the authority to do ministry and that authority did not come from the leaders no. of the regular line it didn't come from Caiaphas I want to read something here from Spalding and Megan page 176 paragraph 5 shall the regular lines shall the regular lines which say that every mind shall be controlled by two or three minds at Battle Creek continue to bear sway. The Macedonian cry is coming from every quarter. Shall men go to the regular lines to see whether they will be permitted to labor or shall they go out and work as best they can, depending on their own abilities and on the help of the Lord beginning in a humble way, and creating an interest in the truth in places in which nothing has been done to give the warning message. That is a solution. Read this mm -hmm. one for us. This is pamphlet 113, page 14, paragraph 2. Let not any living hand of minister or layman be laid upon you with the statement, you cannot go here, you must not go there. Mm -hmm. We shall not support you if you do not go at our bidding or if you do not give yourself to the work of bringing souls into the truth in some certain place designated by us. God will bless you as you continue to search for lost souls in out of the way places. In closing, I want to read this statement from Testimonies to Ministers, page 411. Now, since these apostate gatekeepers are barring the gate and, and they are literally withholding God's messengers from entering the churches of Adventism to minister to the people, to prepare them for what is soon to come upon this earth, what's going on in the world, how close we are to the enforcing of the mark of the beast and the work of preparation. How are we going to reach these individuals in those churches where the ministers are saying those ministers 
on our blacklist cannot come to our churches. How is Christ going to reach those individuals? We don't have to guess. When they barred Christ from the synagogues and John the Baptist, how did they reach the people, the sincere ones in the synagogues? How did they reach them? What did John the Baptist do? Called them to the wilderness. Mm -hmm. The people left the synagogues. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter three and verse five through verse number, verse number 12. It says, they then, it says, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. The people had to go out to hear the message of present truth during Christ's first advent. How will it be in these last days? How will it be? What about Christ? It was Christ who said in Matthew 15, when those leaders were marginalizing the disciples, the 70, even Christ himself, Christ said now to those people who were sincere, he said, those, pe those, those priests, elders, they're blind guides. He says what? If the blind lead the blind, and if the blind follow the blind, both shall fall in a ditch. And in Acts chapter 2, when the disciples were marginalized and barred from the synagogues, it was Peter who stood up and said with the other apostles that those who were coming into present truth, he said, save yourself, save yourselves, Acts 2.40, from this untoward generation. And those who accepted the truth from those apostles and were baptized, it says, they continued in the apostles' doctrines and fellowship, and they broke bread daily. daily. In Testimonies to Ministers, page 411, paragraph 1, in closing, I read. It says here, Satan, it's so fitting, Satan has laid every measure possible that nothing shall come among us as a people to reprove and rebuke us and exhort us to put away our errors. But there is a people who will bear the ark of God. Some will go out from among us who will bear the ark no longer. In other words, they will become discouraged because they're being called names, called extremists, fanatics. They're being barred. But these cannot make walls to obstruct the truth. For it will go onward and upward to the end. So all that my call is doing, Bill not and the rest, the general conference, some of them, the leaders, all that they're doing. Inspiration says, but these cannot make walls to obstruct the truth, for it will go onward and upward to the end. In the past, God has raised up men, and he still has men of opportunity waiting, prepared to do his bidding, men who will go through restrictions, Amen. which are only as walls daubed with untempered mortar. When God puts his spirit upon men, they will work. They will proclaim the word of the Lord. They will lift up their voice like a trumpet. The truth will not be diminished or lose its power in their hands. Last sentence. They will show the people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Praise the Lord. It's my prayer that these leaders who are in the wrong, it's clear from scripture, that they turn, that they repent before it is eternally too late. Amen. We've come to a time where we see that we not only need to be reformers in this world and protest against restrictions of religious liberty, but even in the church. You know, the servant of the Lord says that the Reformation did not end, as many suppose, with Martin Luther. It is to be carried forward until the close of time. God is calling today for reformers. Those who are standing for the truth, we encourage you to continue to do just that. We encourage you not to cower, not to be fearful, not to bow to any false stipulations that go contrary to the word of God. Yes. 
Did, did Amos bow when restrictions were placed upon him? He still gave the message with power, with conviction. Did John the Baptist bow? No, he didn't. What about the priests, the faithful priests and ministers during Jeroboam's time? They continued to carry forward the work of God to see souls saved, both within Israel and also in the world. And Christ himself, our exemplar, he continued to minister, even though restrictions were placed upon him. And so we encourage you to stay true to your duty to uplift the law and the testimony and not to compromise with truth. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful you have revealed your truth to us and to whom much is given, much is required. Your word is so true. What is in darkness will come to light. I pray that you will strengthen us to remain focused on the calling you have placed upon our lives. Encourage your people. Work to call leaders and laity and people to repentance that we may be fitted to do a work for you in a world dying, in a world longing for truth, and yet Seventh-day Adventists are fast asleep. Awaken us, prepare us, use us, and then, dear God, we say, save us. Give us victory over sin, and we thank you for hearing us. We thank you for answering, is our prayer, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Again, we thank you for tuning in to Prophetic Insights, and may the Lord find us all faithful at his coming.